Hello everyone, this is uh, Chris back again with the Ancient Scholar. Sorry I've been, uh, uh, haven't posted any videos recently. I've been really busy at school getting ready uh, for the respiratory board examination, so I've actually spent a significant amount of time out of, out of town. Uh, so today I'm actually going to start the discussion, and we'll finish it at a different time, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to pose a question. And the question is going to be related to oxygen, something we should all know and, what, uh, know, uh, and love very well, but we'll probably find out that perhaps we don't know it as well as we thought we did. Um, so in basic chemistry, when we took our chemistry prerequisites, hopefully everyone has some, some uh, memories of that, and what, the, what we learn in our, our basic, our core chemistry courses it, it, about electrons and so on and so forth, about the atomic model for an atom is that I have a nucleus, that has the protons and neutrons. Protons take on positive charge, and electrons are attracted to that nucleus, and then the electrons will exist in areas around the nucleus called shells. Okay, called shells. And uh, you might know that they don't literally exist in these shells. We just know through through quantum mechanics that there's a high probability of finding electrons in a certain shell. And uh, if we look at oxygen, oxygen has an atomic number of um, eight, which means there are eight protons in the nucleus. And in nature, if there are eight positive charges in the nucleus, I should have eight electrons um, somewhere around that nucleus, or high probability of finding them somewhere around that nucleus. And we probably remember that when we talk about shells, um, <coughs> As we fill the shells up, we know that the, the shell closest to the nucleus, the first shell, um, can only hold two electrons. So there are two electrons there, it's full, and then I have to move up. So wh what, that, what that tells me is that I have how many electrons left over? Well, I have six left over, and so the six remaining electrons will fill the outer shell, like so. Now, you probably remember from basic chemistry a general rule of thumb, and this, all this, this electrons and shells uh, kind of stuff comes from a, a chemist, um, a very famous chemist by the name of Lewis, and you may remember him from Lewis Acids and Bases and, and, uh, versus Bronsted Lowry and so on and so forth. Um, he kind of came up with this, this, some of these general concepts, and he came up with a, what's known as octet stability. And what he said was, look, if I have eight electrons in my valence, and if you remember, the outer shell, the outer shell is the valence shell, and that's where all the bonding occurs. That's um, the inner shell, what we call the core electrons, we don't really care so much about in chemistry because they're not interacting, but it's the outer electrons, um, the valence electrons that lead to bonding, chemical bonding. So we're very, very concerned about those. They're very interesting to us. We said that if uh, I can get eight electrons in this outer shell, in the valence shell, atoms are generally going to be happy. Um, and that is kind of what leads to bonding. So here I have oxygen, and clearly oxygen is not happy according to the octet rule, according to Lewis. What can we do to make oxygen happy? Well, one of the things we can do is we can have another oxygen atom around. Okay, and I'm only going to draw the valence electrons. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six. Now I'll throw those in just for completion there. I have eight. And we know that I can have sharing of electrons. So I have a single electron here. These guys can share, right? And these guys can share here, right? And basically, what, what that means is now, because they're sharing, this guy can pretend like he has two, this guy can pretend like he has two, and they're happy. Well, that sharing of electrons is what leads to bonding. In this case, I have two covalent bonds. Two covalent bonds. Okay? And um, what, that, what we can draw that, we can simplify that in the Lewis structure, and we can draw something like this. I can draw an O, my two covalent bonds, O, right? 
So there's one electron here, two, three, four, right? And then I have electron here, electron here, electron here. Uh huh. And I can have something that looks kind of like that. And it looks like there are eight electrons through the sharing, right? Well, here's where the problem is with this whole Lewis uh, structure. The whole, the whole problem is oxygen has a property known as paramagnetism. It's paramagnetic. And that's actually the principle behind uh, some oxygen sensors or analyzers is they use a magnet. That means that when this oxygen is in a magnetic field, it becomes, it, it, it basically turns into a little magnet itself and it aligns itself with that magnetic field. Well, we know that uh, paramagnetism is related uh, to having an electron all by its lonesome, un, what we call an unpaired electron. Generally, the electrons like to be in pairs. Well, this Lewis structure here predicts that I have no unpaired electrons yet oxygen is paramagnetic. So experimentation tells us there should be unpaired electrons, but the theory, Lewis uh, tells us, no, that's not the case. This is a concerning problem. This is a considerable problem for chemistry, and it should concern us as respiratory therapists because we should know as much as we possibly can about oxygen. So I will pose this question how can we resolve this disparity or perhaps is something wrong? Do we have to look at chemical bonding um, a little differently than we were taught? And I'll leave it there, guys. Thanks for hanging in there. Bye-bye.